sometimes you get lucky, I, I, I think, and um, you accidentally, this is what happened to us on TED, we accidentally created a, a bunch of characters who really spoke to each other. And that's why the show hit the ground running. What we didn't realize was that we, it, it, you know, these were all separate people, but when we brought them all together, it looked like a family. That's the, the key to it, and that's why I think it was such a big success right off the bat. Hey! They on? Oh, they are, Ted. Yeah. Oh, wait now. What? They've gone off again. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait, yeah, that's it, Ted. They're back. No, God, they're gone again. Right, wait a minute, Ted. No, keep it like that. No, gone. Oh, God, Ted. That's it, Ted. You're a genius. Gone again. Right, back. Gone. Back. Gone. Back. Gone. Back. Dougal, just sit down. <laughs> How do you avoid cliches and using stock characters and stock dialogue? And... I kind of like some cliches because they're funny, you know. Um, I guess there's an argument that, that Moss in, in the IT crowd is the most, you know, cliched nerd character ever, but, but that kind of suits me. It kind of suits me, the idea of a glasses wearing nerd. Oh, four! I mean, five! I mean, fire! <laughs> you can go so cliché, it becomes... Yeah, well, exactly. That's kind of what we did with Ted as well. We had an alcoholic who, who drinks toilet duck. You know what that does to you. How many fingers am I holding up to you? <laughs> Three. And a character so stupid, he sometimes doesn't know that he's not slept. Anyway, night, Dougal. Night, Ted! <sighs> oh, damn. Damn. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, no, Dougal, it's not morning. I just switched on the light again to wind the clock. All oh, right. Sorry about that, Ted. <laughs> People might have noticed I'm not the most naturalistic of, of writers. I, I like broad strokes and, and big comic moments and big gags and chunky jokes. Three people in one. I mean, most characters should be a good three people you know. So you don't pick, literally pick. I mean, Frank in Shameless is three to four people, uh, both male and female in my family. They never know which bits are them. I, they don't all pick the wrong bit, you know, just when it's quite kindly at Christmas or something like that. And you know, go, well, that's more like me. No, it's not. You're that twat. <laughs> I'm there to All right, Frank. You OK? Is that my teacher? Yeah. I, I just, I just meant what happened. <laughs> Jesus, Frank! Look in a pub, so I'll pass it on. When you were coming up with the characters for Peep Show, w were those kind of blank sheets of paper or were those moulded around the actors? Well, yeah, we knew that Dave and Rob would be in it, so we, we did design it for them, and that is a huge bonus, cos as soon as you get them in the room, you're kind of... the character's moulded to the actor much more tightly than if you're just casting it. Congratulations, you've killed a sentient being. Richard Moss was created for, um, for Richard Iowetti, but, but we had to find Chris O'Dowd, we had to find Catherine, but I knew I always wanted Matt Berry and I always, I always wanted um, Richard Iowetti, you know. With EastEnders, I worked out, as I progressed in, you know, in the last two or three years I was there, I was a series consultant, and um, I just worked out that the, the the characters that really worked were the characters that were quite close to the actors. What we, we started doing was we used to do actors' workshops. So we'd literally trawl and get 20 or 30, 40 uh, actors from London um, into a rehearsal room. The, the Slater family was a good example of that. We just literally got 30 actors over three days in a rehearsal room. The first person that stood out for me was Jessie Wallace. She just came in. It was Cat Slater. Jet black hair really filthy laugh, um, blinged up, short skirt. It was like, wow, it's fantastic. So we took Jesse and then gradually saw who kind of did that and then Casey Ainsworth and, and, and the, the Slater family came together. What are you doing behind there? Don't tell me you gone and got yourself a job. Don't get too excited. Just open a donut in distress. The casting of EastEnders there, or the creating those characters, that almost sounds like casting a reality show, in a way. Yeah, but, you know, it's not many miles away. I mean, that's what, that's what EastEnders is, you know, that's, that's the con, isn't it? Isn't that what we're saying? Aren't we saying that Albert Square actually exists? 
I think it's just the way that you approach things. I think it's the way that you do things. And the genesis of Life on Mars was, and Gene Hunt, was that we wanted to write the Sweeney, but the Sweeney didn't exist. So we said, well, can we write the Sweeney? Can we do like a period piece? Can we do that again? Because what was interesting was obviously the pace laws had come in in the meantime. So modern police dramas, can't, you can't beat people up anymore and throw them down the stairs, it's not allowed. And it's worse than that, it's unrealistic. So can we do a period piece? That's really not going to work. OK, well, how do we get there then? And once we started on that process, it kind of just slotted into place. And Gene Hunt was basically Jack? Gene Hunt was Jack Regan. Police, stay where you are. You're Nick Sonny. So you've got your vicars in a twist. How important do you think a character's name is? The brilliant thing about working with Arthur was we used to enjoy naming our characters so much. Like, we, we, we just endless, had endless fun doing it. Um, you know, Noel Early, you know, um, Noel Furlong. Um, uh, I'm trying to, oh, Pat Mustard, who's the name of the, 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 the milkman and speed. These names, we just love them. Pat Mustard, immediately the character just pops into life in front of your eyes. On my own, I'm not as good at it. I can't quite do it. I can't quite decide on the name. I can't quite commit. One of the reasons why the IT crowd took, took so long to find, um, to, to kind of find its legs was because uh, I, I couldn't decide on Roy's name. First of all, his first name. Took me forever to come up with Roy, <laughs> and you it's know only three letters. I know, and then uh, well, it's very different to if I called Roy Jim. That's a different person, and um, and so I was thinking, you know, I was almost almost literally thinking, is he a Jim or a Roy, or is he a Phil, or is he a Paul? You know what I mean? And it and it drove me nuts. It was interesting doing Tortured recently, which were now which were now turned into a thriller with three writers. So we all had to work together on a continuous story. So we all sat in a room. It's the first time I've done that, with like a thriller sort of thing. And um, anyway, to an event, new characters that came along. And I was going, right, there's a boy called Stephen, and this happens to him. And the other two writers were going, how, do, how did you just make his name up like that? And it's like, I was going, well, what's his name? It's like, and they obviously go through a process of sitting there. You know, no one's right or no one's wrong. They go through a process of sitting there going, oh, is he Arthur? Is he Albert? Is he Stephen? Is he Jake? What fits? And I just hit it. I just the moment I think of them, there's the name. Otherwise, otherwise they don't exist really. Um, when you're writing dialogue, how could, do you do you hear it in your head? Do you speak it aloud or? What happens to me is I I have a scene heading, so you know it's interior, um, wine bar day. I I have put the characters in there, and if I've done the work on the characters and I know who they are as people. I put them in there and I put, take that little thing and I put it in my head and they start talking to each other and I, I write down what they say. So I absolutely hear it. And it is sometimes I can't type, because I only type with one finger. I'm doing that, I don't know why. I only type with one finger. Really? One finger. And uh, I'm quick, though. I am the quickest finger in what? the West. Li I am literally like that. Uh, but I can do... That's crazy. I can do <laughs> 20,000 words a minute. It's like, <laughs> it's like Superman. What I do is I think what I do is I... I act out the characters on the page. I think it's sort of like being an actor in your own head. In a way, it doesn't feel like proper writing yeah, somehow. It's, it's, sort, it's different and you, it's, it's like you are sort of playing and messing around and, yeah, it's... it's channeling. Not... Chat is a bit channeling, yeah. <laughs> that was a wanky term I just used. <laughs> it's a psychic term, isn't it? <laughs> now and again, I, I see it typed up like ticker tape. And you go, oh, my God, that's a good line. Like, I've just been given it from somewhere else. I mean, from someone else. And, uh, yeah, and it's, and it's always better than the one I would have thought of first. Uh, what, what do you think differentiates good dialogue from bad dialogue? You know, the easiest way to, to explain it, I guess, is write your sentence, whatever that is, all right? So it's two guys outside a pub, they come out, they're going in opposite directions, and the dialogue is, great having a drink with you, really enjoyed it, great game of, game of darts, I go now, I'm going to have a shower, and I'll see you later, all right? And that's, because that's, people do write dialogue like that. And a good test is just keep taking words away, take them away one at a time, so it still makes sense. So that get, gets rid of all the I am's and the everything else, all the, all the things. And if you do that, what you end up with is later. And that's actually how people talk. I think you can learn craft, um, you can learn story structure, you can learn narrative drive 
But if you can't write dialogue, you're kind of screwed. Bad 